Welcome back to the Fortman Podcast. This is the finale of season five, and I'm so happy to have my friends back with me. We got John Luke and Luke, and we got Reeves and Parker. Uh, Jacob had a last minute uh, turkey hunt that he forgot he promised his brother that he was going to go to. After I was with him all day yesterday, he forgot to tell me that. <laughs> Uh, but that's besides the point. But um, <laughs> we're going to get to questions that you guys asked us on social media. And hopefully, um, yeah, hopefully these encourage you and challenge you and um, speak to you wor- with, uh, with where you're at. First question we're going to get to today. It, um, it was one that really just kind of hit me and it stuck with me. And it says, uh, how to truly fall in love with God. And um I just love that question. I thought it was so simple, but um, yeah, it's somebody actually seeking and searching for how do you actually, you know, develop a, just just a love um, for God because at, at the end of the day, it is something that we all cultivate, just like you know any relationships your your wife, your spouse, um, you know, a friend. It's the same with God and, and and with Jesus. It's something that you you know you put time into and, and you cultivate. So, what um how do you truly fall in love with God? Well, I guess I'll start. Um, New Testament. Yeah. Well, I was thinking, well, we can go to, we'll do this later. But uh, so just thinking about relationship wise with Jesus, like if we're talking about like with your wife or whatever, with say us as a friend group, the more that you hang out together and spend time together and talk to each other and get past that surface level of like we're just friends type Mm -hmm. deal and like really get down to the what's really going on in life. I think that's the same way how we fall more in love with Jesus is when we're the most real with him about what's actually going, mm-hmm. even though he knows what's going on in our life is he wants and desires us to confess that to him, to talk to him. And even like in times of my life, when I've been mad at God, just saying, God, I'm, I'm really struggling mm-hmm. with you right now. Like I'm, I'm upset with you. And there's, there's some type of, I think just realness and rawness that yeah. Jesus wants from us that when we open that up, there's a de- like a deeper level of love that you begin to to feel from him because then he's like, man, my, my child is longing for me and yearning for me. And I think that's in relationships for us, the more we're that way here on this earth with each other, the more that we fall in love with each other as as a buddy or as a your spouse or your girls, like your kids, whatever it may be. And so I think... Um, Getting kind of getting to that point is First John three. Uh, this is the old hunting Bible, so give me one second. And I can't see you using it over there. I know. Just look closely. First <laughs> uh, John three sixteen, not John three sixteen. It says, "This is how we know what love is: that Jesus Christ laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters." And so, I know that's kind of talked about a lot, but it's the the concept of laying your life down, not necessarily like dying for a brother, but more so just like we were saying, the confessional part, like that's mm-hmm. laying something uh-huh. out there that's hard to do, right? That worldly, we don't like to do that. Um, and so I don't know, to the one that asked the question or the one that maybe didn't but wanted to, I think that's kind of a good place to start is knowing the one that we serve laid it down. Mm-hmm. Uh, we know obviously physically, but also spiritually and what he left to come here for us. So anyways, yeah. that's, no, that's good. I think there's different ways you can kind of interpret the question. I, you know, one from the standpoint of being a believer, how do you fall in love with God as in like, how do you kind of keep, you know, that relationship going, but also, you know, how do you get to a point where you want to even fall in love with God in the first place? That's kind of how I read it was like, um, <clears throat> you know, living in sin, I, you know, love my lifestyle, but I kind of, but I, but I want to know God. I want to, I want to love God. It's like, what are the the first steps that I can kind of take to like actually, you know, fall in love with God? And I think really, at least for me in my life, what I found was, you know, I didn't truly start to fall in love with God until I actually started to like hate my sin, you know, like, because when you get so, because sin can be fun, right? Like that's, you know, it's, it's 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 a thing. It's it it it's temporary pleasure. It's not you know lasting. There, there's really no satisfaction after that. But it's hard to love God when you're also so caught up in all these other worldly things. So for me, it really just got to a point where just believing that Jesus was better than all these other things I was addicted to, right? Um, drinking and partying and women and all these other things. So it got to a point where 
for me to fall in love with God, I had to start to truly hate these other things that I was addicted to. Um, so one, I guess to answer the question from that point of view, how to truly fall in love with God is just, you know, I would say just confessing those things to him, um, having people around you that you can, you know, talk through those things with and getting to a point where you, you know, want to put to death that lifestyle that is not you know, good and mm-hmm. truly start um, reading your Bible, praying and, and try to f- start falling in love with God from the standpoint of, yeah, just leaving, leaving this old life, leaving um, these things that you know that are not good for you. Just like your relationship with your spouse, like if you're not having alone time with your spouse, like you're not going to have intimacy. You're not going to grow deeper in love with them. You're not going to draw closer to them. So I think just taking an inventory of how you spend your time and your life, like if you never think about God, then it's going to be pretty hard to fall more in love with him if you don't, if you're not prioritizing him in your life whatsoever. It's not, you're going to wake up one day and go, man, I really love God now. You know, like, as we all know, being married, arguably more days than not, you don't necessarily wake up just feeling that love for your spouse. Like you have to go, you have to really work at it sometimes. It's not just like this warm, bubbly feeling that you feel every day. Sure, there's plenty of days like that, you know, but in the everyday grind of life and in struggles and everything, it's like, man, you have to be intentional and you have to make sacrifices even when you don't feel like it. And the more you do that, I feel like the deeper that love grows and it's just over time, it's a slow process. So I think if you're discouraged in, Maybe your lack of love for God, there are some times when it just doesn't feel great. It doesn't feel like it. Maybe you thought it would to be in love with God, but there's just seasons that that's the case. Maybe that's not encouraging, but no, I've been through that, and I'm sure. Yeah, you'll have. What's well, what's well, it's often t- it's even like in marriage. It's it's after the deep hard conversations, is, which is when you grow mm-hmm. stronger, more in love, right? So right. It's, it's the same with God. It's like if every time you communicate with God, if it's just surface level you know, really, you're not really being authentic and mm-hmm. really saying the things that you're kind of wrestling with. And it can only, you know, that, that relationship can only go so far, but it's the yeah. same with marriage. It's like, oftentimes those conversations suck and are, are not, they're not fun to have, but then after you have them, it's like, there's like an intimacy in it that you feel, mm-hmm. you know, so much closer. So I think that's the thing with God too. It's totally, you know, if you want to truly fall more in love with him, you 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 talk to him about deep things that that are you know sometimes can be hard to talk about. Yeah. I see you moving closer to your mic over there. I mean, only thing I would add to that is is I just as I'm thinking about that question, I think it, I would bet that it's probably somebody that feels like they just don't understand why they feel like all of a sudden they're just not as in love with the Lord or feel as close to him and in their relationship with him as they, as they did previously, or maybe they're at the beginning of that journey and they're just trying to figure it out. But I think, um, you know, there's just seasons kind of like I've said that you just, I think that the, the walk with Christ just often looks like for most people, because we're sinful, like you drift away and you lose, I mean, we're going to mess it up and we're going to be focused on the wrong things. And, um, I personally just feel like I just identified that in my life. And, and so all, I, I mean, you just have, it's just identifying it and being able to like, it's easy to put it in context of a marriage because, um, you know, your wife is, you can, you can see her, like mm-hmm. she's there, you live in the same house, you do life together. And so if things are off kilter. You're like, man, I got. We've got to just get to this because, you know, there's something more. I mean, there's. It's more like it's right. Like your wife is right in front of you. Like God is not uh, visibly tangible to us, and so it can. It's easier for us to just let that slide, mm-hmm. but it's it's way more treacherous. And so, it's really. I think the only thing I would add is, it's just having the ability to lay down your pride sometimes and being like, God, I have this wrong and. Um, I've lost sight of like what we have together and I need to get back to this and like mm-hmm. I need to put some other things aside right now and I don't know that's just kind of just getting away this weekend with my wife and some friends just kind of found that in my life and I was finally able to stop and just like really do that and address that and and it's humbling you know sometimes yeah. it's hard 
Pornography is not an easy subject to hear about, but it is something that we must talk about today. And there are so many companies that are out there working against you, but that there is one company that is working for you, and that is Covenant Eyes. Covenant Eyes is a trusted resource that I use, and I know so many people that have used it in the past. And it is incredible if you are uh, truly in the fight to want to end pornography for your life. Pornography used to be such a big issue for me when I was growing up throughout high school. Um, and even early on in, in college, it was something that I really wrestled with. And almost every single guy that I know has struggled with it in the past. And that is why Covenant Eyes is the number one trusted software for the last 23 years for Christians seeking to live a porn-free life. Porn is damaging marriages, families, and the work of the church by holding people hostage to this secret sin. And Victory by Covenant Lies is a powerful tool that helps Christians who are serious and want to quit porn for good or never start in the first place. Victory combines industry-leading technology with decades of experience in leadership and recovery content, accountability, and behavior change. And the Victory app has powerful accountability features built in, and the optional blocking technology makes it an unparalleled tool in the fight to live a porn-free life. And not only that, but scripture teaches us the importance of being held accountable. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. So here's how it works. First, use my link covenanteyes.com slash huff and download Victory on all of your devices. Once installed, Victory runs silently in the background of your devices and uses cutting edge AI technology to watch the screen for behavior that does not match your goals. Next, you will invite a trusted friend to be your ally. And this is someone who can walk beside you through the ups and downs of recovery. Your ally will get push notifications of any porn use and reminders to have accountability conversations even if everything is going great. So remember, accountability is not others calling you out, but it is others calling you up to the person that you are in Christ. Anyone can get started on the path of recovery for free by visiting covenantize.com slash huff and using my promo code huff for 30 days free or by clicking on the link in the show notes today. That's covenantize.com slash huff. Go check it out. To just kind of go off what you said about like God being physically tangible in your life. Like I, I think about it in another way of like knowing, just knowing God and knowing about God. You kind of hear a lot in church, like no, have a relationship with God. Don't just know about God, but also it is sometimes just knowing about God, like just reading the Bible and just knowing the stories and seeing the things he did. And like, I think about, you know, my wife and things, you know, in part of falling in love with her, it's knowing about her. I know what she likes to eat. I know her favorite color. I know, you know, what's going to make her mad or what's going to make her happy, you know? And, and that's the same with God. Like you read the Bible and you say, okay, Jesus liked fish. He really loved figs. Like you start to see these things just about Jesus and about God throughout the Bible that you see their, his personality and that is one aspect to where you can fall deeper in love with them because it's more real. It's like you see him, you know, um, in your everyday life. On like a deeper level, uh, I just heard this the other day that the whole Bible is God promising things and then fulfilling it. And so for good and bad, and it goes all the way from the beginning. It's like Adam and Eve, don't eat the fruit or you'll die. They eat the fruit and they, you know, get cast out of the garden. Um, or Noah, like build this boat, I'm sending the flood, then he does it. And he goes all the way up to Jesus saying, okay, I'm going to die. And then he dies and then he comes back. And then it's, okay, I'm going to send my spirit. And then, you know, however long later he sends the spirit. And so it's all this God promising and then fulfilling it. And when you start to see that happen in history, as you read through the Bible and you start to apply it to your own life of like, okay, what are the things God's promising me? And how is he like fulfilling that? It, it, that all of that just knowledge about what he's doing and the way that he's working, that's not even necessarily about you, I think is, is one way that I've found, I've grown, grown closer in my relationship to him. That's good. All right, I'm excited about this next question. <clears throat> what is something that you wish the church would talk about more? Bum, bum, bum. Well, I mean, obviously there's, you know, there's the big stuff. Um, 
like gender and sexuality and, and all those different things. It's not at all what I thought the biggest issue was going to be. <laughs> what, what, what do you think the biggest issue is? Okay, I don't know. I don't know. Keep going. Keep going. Well, I'm, well, I'm, I'm saying I'm biggest issue from the standpoint of like things that we're most afraid to like mm-hmm. yeah. talk about. To talk about. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm not saying that's the biggest problem with the church. No, I'm no, saying no. that's just something that, you know, we don't want to address. Yeah. For, for reasons um, that are pretty obvious. Um, but something that I wish the church were talking about, going you know, I think something that I wish the church would do a better job at, I think that's maybe where I'll take the question. Um, I think just from a, well, well, one, I think that sometimes the church, especially the Western church, we get so caught up in just like routine and just like schedule and like, you know, everything, like, you know, exactly what's going to happen every single service. I think sometimes that, um, I think we can do a better job at that of, you know, whatever that could look like of, you know, spacing out, um, times, whether it's 9 to 11, maybe you move it to 9 to 1130 or 9 to 12, just because I think sometimes, at least for me, things that I've found, it's like, if I know I'm going to church and I know there's going to be three exact, three worship songs, I can probably guess two of the three that are on the same 10 song rotation. Um, there's going to be announcements and then there's going to be a 25 to 30 minute message and there's going to be an altar call. So I think sometimes for me, I think something that, that we could do a better job at is just mixing up, you know, scheduling for what a Sunday can look like. And, and and that's the church by and large. It's like almost every single church I go to, it's three or four songs, announcements, message. It's, I've never seen it be even message worship. I've never seen it. Like I've, I, I've just haven't seen, you know, people really switch that up. Um, so that's one thing. And then I'll, I want to hear from y'all, but so that, that's the one thing. And then the other thing is just evangelism. I think, we don't do the best job at like inviting people into church. I heard a quote a few years ago that said that the church has become keepers of the aquarium instead of being like fishers of men. So basically it's meaning, you know, we, we lose sight of like going out and catching men, but we get so caught up in like making the people that we have at our church happy and almost like coddling that in a way of like, you know, you want everything to be perfect. And yeah, you know, I think that's when you get into the standpoint of, every time you have a conversation with somebody at church, it's like, Oh, everything's great. Everything's good. Cause you're always so, you just want to meet people's like felt needs, you know, instead of actually getting to the heart of how people are truly doing. But I think we can do a better job at mixing up scheduling for, for churches. And I think that we could do a better job at evangelism and like inviting people in instead of just, you know, maybe always just focusing on the people inside the church, the people outside of the church. Yeah. I, I think like one thing I've, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, like what do I want the church to talk about more? And I think it, this is a non-political answer, but like science and history and all just creation, other things in general. Um, you know, my son, he's four. And so he got like super into dinosaurs and so, you know, I was like, buy all these dinosaur books and I'm like reading them. And then I, <laughs> I was like, huh, I wonder all the, you know, dinosaur books are like secular authors and scientists. And so I'm like, what do like Christians believe about dinosaurs? And it struck me out like I never learned about archaeology in school or in church or ever. And so I, I Google, what is the Christian belief about dinosaurs? And it is wide ranging. <laughs> it goes everywhere from demons to animals to the like, you know, thousands of year old to millions of years to billions of years. Like there's no like Christian kind of stance on it. And that I think is just like kind of one encapsulation encapsulation of where I think the especially I think Southern evangelicals are, we're held back a little bit from the wider world in having a community, talking to people about science and history because it's a little like, it's like separate. It's like you have your church life, you have the Bible, but then you have the rest of history and it's not the same thing. And that to me is just, it's kind of really interesting right. where you know, at the same time, as people were doing things while the Bible was happening, you know, if you look at timelines, it's like, 
the while David and Goliath are happening, like Stonehenge is being built and you have all these things happening all over the world. And I think when we so narrow a focus on like just the history of the Bible, it almost turns into like a little mythology for us where you have like hard science and then Bible history, you know? So like kind of mixing those things. So Sunday morning, you would love to talk about dinosaurs. Oh, and yeah, totally. Which that would be, you know, like I gotta say the next that. next sermon series. Oh, I would, yeah, yeah I would love that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But I say that, but then, you know, that's like, you would bring your friend to a Sunday and the pastor's like, we're going to talk about dinosaurs oh, yeah. and paleontology. And you'd be like, oh, are you kidding me? Like I brought the one Sunday he talks about something that has nothing to do with our day-to-day -day life, <laughs> you know? Sounds like a, um, gosh, what was the thing growing up? Um, VBS. Yeah. It's like a vacation Bible school uh -huh. Sunday. Yeah. Uh -huh. I was thinking it's a great point in like an evangelical sense, like, a lot of people maybe that don't believe about God have those questions of like Big Bang, like how did we get right. here? Like what's going on? So mm -hmm. I think a lot of us don't have those answers that would help us, you know, right when sharing the gospel. So mm -hmm. yeah, and I mean just in our own life, like if you right. hear, if you are a scientist or you're in those circles and you hear people talking about the Big Bang, it's like, what do you? How does that fit into the Bible? Mm -hmm. It's just a question to talk about, right? I feel like understanding that would just take us in deeper awe of God and what He's done. You know, it's all mm -hmm. right, significant. So that's is that is, is that what you wish the is that what you wish that the church were talking about? No, more? I mean that was just interesting. It got no, me thinking. Is like I never thought about that. I agree with what he said. It's very important. I yeah, Louis talks a lot. Um, had some messages on that. That yeah. was very very impactful in my life. I think in high school, mm -hmm. um, he was, and I think it takes somebody of that much wisdom and yeah. study mm -hmm. to present that in a way to where it is like, man, we we serve an author and a creator that did create that and the way he explained mm -hmm. it. But yeah, I think that that's a good point, John Luke. Well, that that's <laughs> one of the sermons I was thinking of is like, we all know the earth is a golf ball. Like I most people, especially our age, like remember yeah. that sermon that Louis gave, you know, and and that really started kind of th making me think about science and mm -hmm. the Bible and how it relates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the, that question, uh, more so like, maybe not what the church talks about more, but how the church presents or acts, like the way they deliver themselves. I think what you were saying, or that person asked is, <clears throat> I was talking to a guy that was in an addiction, addiction program, like AA type stuff, and he was saying the that is like the most safest place, if you're an addict or not, to go into because... There's literally no judgment on, mm -hmm. and pretty much if you're there, you, you're there for the same type of reasoning. You mm -hmm. have an addictive personality like we all do sitting at this table. Um, but he says, like, when I go to a church, it's not the same feeling there. And so what can we do as a church to make that feeling change for people? Because like Christian was kind of hitting on earlier, it's like there's something that we're doing that we do. We, we have the people that are in the church that feel comfortable in the church. Like Jesus tells us to go after the people that are outside the church. And so how can we have that, I guess, approachability as the church to where they feel that comfort to where like, man, this is the whole, like, this is a safe place. This is where I want to come get healing. It's not to go get healed by the worldly things. And I think that's where us as the church body have done a pretty bad job because we like sticking to our people and, in our hub within the church. And so um, that's something I've been thinking a lot lately because it's when he said that to me, it's like, man, well, I guess obviously we're not doing a good job of, and I kind of think of discipleship along with that. Like once we're really good at sending people to retreats or sending people to vacation Bible school or kids, but what happens when those several hundred people scatter and leave? Like where, where does discipleship start for them? You know? And so, I think that's something um, I wish the church would do, I guess, be better at is discipleship outside of like, hey, I gave my life to Jesus. Well, I'd hate to say that's the easy part uh, for us as Christians is it saying, hey, I'm tired of me, but how do I do this after that, you know? Mm -hmm. so. It is important to me that the supplements I take are of the highest quality. And that's why for the last three years, I've been drinking AG1. And unlike many supplement brands, 
AG1 is researched and developed by an in-house team of scientists, doctors, and nutritionists with decades of experience in their respective fields. And so with that being said, quality for AG1 is not just a buzzword. It's a commitment backed by expert-led scientific research, high-quality ingredients, industry-leading manufacturing, and rigorous testing. At each step of the process, AG1 goes above and beyond industry standards. And I know that I can trust what's in every scoop of AG1 because AG1 is NSF certified for sport, which is one of the most rigorous independent quality and safety certification programs in the supplement industry. Taking care of my health should not be complicated. And AG1 simplifies this by replacing multiple health supplements like multivitamins, digestive aids, immune support, and more in just one single scoop. And AG1's ingredients are heavily researched for efficacy and quality. And I love that every scoop also includes vitamin C and zinc to support my immune health. And I decided to try AG1 because I wanted something that I could drink in the mornings that uh, would replace my vitamins. I don't like taking pills. And I wanted something that tasted delicious that I knew would cover all of my nutritional bases that I could just mix in one scoop in water and it just would get me right for the day. Uh, in the mornings, I don't like taking caffeine uh, before my workouts. And I wanted something that could um, really just kind of supplement that. And that's what AG1 has been for me. It helps my gut health, my immune support. I think it tastes delicious and it gives me the energy and focus that I need throughout the day. And I also feel like it helps with my recovery. And I've also gotten so many people on AG1. My dad loves to drink it. My mom's on it now too. Um, and my wife, Sadie, loves to drink it as well. And uh, you've heard me talk about John David from the Duck Harbor before. He loves to drink it. And uh, so many people that I know um, that I've gotten on it are hooked on it and they love it. And they have seen um, the benefits that AG1 talked about for themselves. And that is why I have been partnered with AG1 for so long because they make such a high quality product that I genuinely look forward to drinking every single day. So if you want to replace your multivitamin and more, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase subscription at drinkag1.com slash huff. That's drinkag1.com slash huff. Go check it out. I want to add on to that. I think this might be a hot take to the water audience. This, I know this isn't a hot take to us, but I don't think that Sunday morning is the best time place to invite someone or like evangelize to them like by and large i think and i've been to tons of churches sunday morning is is not a conducive place to bring a new person to church like it it's it's regimented it's like you have to dress a certain way. There's all of these like mm -hmm. societal cultural expectations on a Sunday morning for each church that it's really hard for, I think someone who's not churched to like come into mm -hmm. and naturally like flow into. I mm -hmm. think that it's, if that's all you have, like I'm not saying don't invite people to church. Like if that's all you have, that's better than nothing. But I think that it's better for nighttime stuff or other disciple smaller group discipleship or big like events i think that is a better place to bring people because a, like a coming in you know you walk in everyone's dressed a certain way you might feel a little off you go straight to your seat you do the announcements that don't apply to you you listen to worship which you know god speaks and moves through that you hear a sermon that you may not have the context for if you haven't grown up Christian, and then you are trying to get to lunch as fast as possible. Like everyone just shovels out, you know, like mm -hmm. that's not, and that's not every church and that's not all the time, you know, obviously. But I think that there are, could be better ways that the church as a whole, but also us as individuals can um, create spaces to bring people. Yeah, I agree with that. That's mm -hmm. good. Yeah, some Sundays I'm like, man, if I've never been to church and I show up here, I'm like, <laughs> what is going what on? What in the yeah. world? And I think I think we can do a better job at addressing that, you know, at the forefront of like, even just providing people context of like, hey, this is why we're, you know, singing like this or shouting. Because I'm like, man, if I show up on a Sunday and it's three, like these rock and roll type worship songs, and then it's somebody sprinting up these steps onto the stage and like, you know, doing a few circles. And it's just like, this like rah, rah. I'd be like, like, what is wrong with these people? Well, if, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I had no context for like, yeah. you know, what this is about, I, mm -hmm. I do think that a more intimate setting, you know, like a Bible study or, or um, something like that. I think, I think yeah. that can be more conducive for people that don't have. My, uh, wait, you have something? Yeah. Okay, I, I just think that at the end, at the like, 
when you tear all this back, I think that what we see a lot, and this is, I think this is talked about a good bit, um, is that like you have all these different styles and like churches are trying all these different things and, you know, um, and like whatever they call it, like seeker friendly churches. So mm-hmm. like people that are just coming, like that they have no idea what it even looks like to have faith and, and walk with Christ. And um, you can have all these churches. Like if you go around West Monroe, even you'll have a church in like every style. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that each one that focuses on that thing, like that's a, that's not a bad thing. And mm-hmm. like, um, you know, at some point, like when you get like into the minor details of like how the service is structured and everything else, like that's just a preference thing. Um, but I think that if you look at the fact that we're not, we're not including all those things all in one, like every church should be hitting on like every one of these areas that we're really just defining churches that have picked one thing and that's mm-hmm. what they're going with. But really and truly, I've just been thinking about in my life and my walk with Christ, like it's all the things. So it's like big worship and small worship. It's it's going deeper in the word and preaching the gospel and like studying the gospel. I'm like, your church should do all the things. And I think most of the time, like when you find a church that's just gospel, 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 they don't have any classes that have the, re- like that are providing deeper studies into the word for the congregation that's heard the gospel and has accepted it and started walking with Christ. And so it's just, it's sad to me because then you see like all these different outcomes from those churches. Like, I think you're naturally going to see a lot of people, like a lot of baptisms and a lot of falling away because Mm -hmm. they're not, there's nowhere for them to go after that. Mm -hmm. It's like rah, rah, rah. And most of the time those are paired with big worship and not small and like, there's just the emphasis that it has to be this thing. Mm-hmm. And sometimes like, I like, I don't even think we always have to have it. Like we, we have other, there's so many things that we need to focus on. And I think that, um, I feel like I've been talking about this book everywhere I go lately. John Mark Comer. Yeah. yeah. Practicing the way of John Mark Comer. I just read it, just read it for the third time in the past month. And I'm, I, I'm reading it over and over because I'm ADD and all all these reasons. I, I listen to books. I don't <laughs> read them because I can't, like, I focus way better if I'm listening. And every time I read it, I'm, like, picking up more and more and just, like, man, how can I apply this to my life? But I think that he's talking about it so well because it's all the things. Like, and, mm-hmm. and when we were talking about, like, how do you fall in love with the Lord? Well, you either, you have like one aspect of your relationship with God, which is learning his word. And you have another that's like the actual relationship with God. If you mm-hmm. have one and not the other, you're going to end up massively confused. Yeah. It's yeah. so like, I don't understand why this is just my, I got, this is just me kind of like expressing what I've seen. I don't understand why we're all confused that like you have all these different a- outcomes of confusion. They just look different for every church because we're yeah. just going in one direction mm-hmm. when it's so much more. And if you look at the history of these believers and these people that we're reading about in this book, they did it all. Yeah. They had the like solitude, like all these practices that John mm-hmm. Mark is like pulling out of the rubble. It's like, hey, look at all the stuff that our the people we look up to did. We've completely lost. Mm-hmm. And so I just think, you know, if you have a relationship with God and you're just talking to him all the time, and you never read his word you're going to get confused about what God is actually like Mm -hmm. because you don't learn that from a relationship with him. I think there's some things you can kind of figure out, but you're really not going to get that. And if you just study his word, then, um, you know, I don't know how to describe how that's going to flesh out, but it's not Mm -hmm. going to go well. Right. And that's like kind of how this last season has been for me. You know, I'll be in the word a lot, but I've just been noticing I've lost my actual connection and relationship with him. And I think in the big picture, that's kind of what our churches are doing. Like, it's Mm -hmm. just, we're losing our connection because it's just like, in a lot of ways it is, it's this theatrical, like seeker friendly thing, but sometimes it's on the other end of the spectrum and you're running people off because you're taking one theological concept and and jamming it down people's throats. And then Mm -hmm. you're like, good gosh, like, yeah. I don't even know what this means. Like, give me both sides of the debated thing mm-hmm. and let me figure it out. Yeah. I don't know. That's kind of debatable. But Look at you. I think you had all that in yeah. there. Really good. You were, you were, well, you were sitting I, back in I, your I, chair. I, 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 I got nothing well, to say. I think that these conversations are, like, tough because I'm well, not— Well, no, they are tough. Well, 
I don't, I'm not. That was really good. I hate like, oh, this is what's wrong with the church. It's like, no, I can say all these things about the churches and what they're doing wrong and going in one direction, but they're also doing great and going mm-hmm. in one direction. Yeah. So like, I just. No, for sure. It's yeah. not. I, a, I, was just, I, like, I was just going off the question. I, mean, I love the. That's what I'm saying. I, th- I think the church is doing many of great things. Yeah, yeah. Outreach and all these other things. That but we're, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but 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 then you know, like you said, there are. I mean, there's you know the. I mean, pendulum swings. It's you know you have the the rah 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 stuff. Then you have you know the the super traditional stuff to where it's like you know everything is. Is it, everything just seems so religious, right? So there, mm-hmm. there, there's, there, there's multiple things. But I heard somebody say something the other day, and I actually thought it was really interesting. Just kind of when you were talking about going off of a, of a specific thing, but he said that like we've made church sermons just like a New Testament class, and I just thought it was so interesting. I was like, I've never, I mean, I haven't really thought about it, but I was like, we really do. Like mm-hmm. we study so much of the New Testament, yeah. and just being in Israel a few weeks ago, like it just it it provided so much context for me of just from the old Testament. And like, you have such more of an appreciation for the new Testament. If you actually know the old Testament. Yeah. And I think we don't so, study the old Testament enough. And since I've been back, I've just been obsessed with the, um, the Bama podcast. It's um, so good. They just Listen are just, the yeah, too. they're just super smart and they just, they know Hebrew and all the different things, but just, I, th- I think sometimes we can just get so caught up in the new Testament and it's like, you appreciate the new Testament so much more if you truly understand the Old Testament and the prophecies and what Jesus actually did when he was on the earth. Right. But um, no, I thought, I thought, I thought that was great. That was awesome. I think when you read the Old Testament too, it's like, that was taught in a way that I thought, you know, whatever is being taught on in the New Testament, it's just like opens the door and you're like, oh, that's what that actually means. And there's just, Mm -hmm. it's deeper. It's just, there's a bigger picture. To bring this back to the question of like, what do we wish churches would talk about more? I just like for us and for everyone listening, like it is so hard to like run a church. And like, I totally feel for the yeah. pastors. Uh-huh. And that's why like, I get so it. Hard. Like I get why, you know, it is you're on a schedule and pastors stick to the same theme and have like a the, basically the same sermon outline. Cause it's like really hard to do that every single every Sunday. Week, yeah. yeah. And then it's like, do you move more into politics? Well, you're going to alienate, you know, some. Do you move into, even like what I said, like I wish we talked about science and history. Like you would just lose people walking in the door on that. Yeah. And so it's it's all a balance, yeah. you know. No, for sure. Know, it is so yeah. hard. And that's the thing. Like, I, don't, I don't have the perfect answer to it. I just know that in my life, when I get in a routine of something, I oftentimes just get super complacent with it. Right, yeah. So I just know of like, if I get, if and, and I think that's for people by and large. It's yeah. Like, if you know what you're getting almost every single time, mm-hmm. it can be easy just to go through the motions. And mm-hmm. I think that you are less likely to go through the motions when, you know, uh, when, when something is less predictable. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's what I'm saying. I don't have the perfect answer for it. Yeah. I just know my life when it's like, when, when I'm going to church, it's like, it just feels like it's just a routine and I'm going through the motions mm-hmm. because I know kind of sort of like what I'm going to experience when I go there. Mm-hmm. And I don't have the perfect answer for it, but... I think that's something that we could try to do a better job at. But yeah, I do think that pastors, um, it is a difficult thing to navigate, yeah. um, you know, with all the, yeah. you know. And pastors trying to parse, what yeah. are they speaking from God and when, what's their own personal opinion? Okay. And what do they say from the pulpit from, you know, yeah. on each of those two things? And that's a hard thing for yeah. them to yeah. discern. If you're a pastor, we love you. This is, this is no hate on pastors. Um... Have you struggled with with self shame? If so, how do you handle it? I think we've all struggled with self shame. Um, you know, Matt Chandler always says nobody's meaner to you than you are, which is so true. Um, you know, nobody talks to you like you talk to yourself. Um, I really, I really do wrestle with that. I I, mm-hmm. I call myself an idiot probably fifty times a day. Out um, loud, he says it out loud. I actually do. I, I actually do say it out loud. <laughs> I do. I'll, I'll be like, you're a freaking idiot. No, I say that really way too often. It's actually a problem. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I do struggle with self-shame. I think that, you know, I definitely talk negatively to myself oftentimes. And I think I handle it just with trying to talk to God of just help me with that. I, I want to, you know, have more self-control with how I talk to myself and 
you know, I wouldn't want to talk to somebody else like that. So I don't want to talk to myself like that. So yeah, really just kind of how I'd say I handle it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've definitely struggled with that. I'm definitely really hard on myself and I think we can, for me, it was like my upbringing. I'm sure like I expect myself to be perfect a lot of the times and anytime I'm not hitting the mark like I want to, I just, I'm super down on myself. I feel like the biggest key on that is just opening up about it. Because mm -hmm. if you just sit there, this spiral that quickly happens internally is, not only does it happen quick, but it's pretty devastating what it can do. Like what you end up believing about yourself, if you're not getting that crap out, like it's just, you look up and you're like, man, like, I really believe that about myself. I really believe I'm not worth anything or I'm not good at anything or I'm a terrible husband. You know, it just, it's a spiral that goes out of control. So I think making sure you have people to, that are going to check on you, that you can be honest about how you really feel about women, what you're going through. Cause that just is that's such a key. And I, I heard something one time um, is that we often use truth to tear ourselves down instead of build ourselves up, you know, like not saying we, there shouldn't be conviction. I think a lot of times the enemy can be like, oh, like, no, look, the word says you should be living like this when you're not, like, you suck. And that can create a lot of shame, you know, like conviction and shame and guilt, those are obviously different things, you know, so just don't let yourself, you can be convicted of sin, but that doesn't change your identity in Christ and, and just wrestling with those things. So, yeah, I think we all have that, but, be honest and open about where you're at more than you think you should be, I guess would be a summary of how to deal with that. Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. I think you just can't let it get to where it, it becomes like self pity, you know, like turning self shame into self pity to where it just makes you. What was me? Yeah. Yeah. You just like, you just become so ineffective and you're, you know, you're just like moping all the time, which I mean, you know, it's, is at, at, at least for me, self shame comes the most after like I mess up or, I, or mm -hmm. I'd, I'd mess up with something. It's like I just have a hard time getting past it and getting yeah. over it. So then I really do. I'd, I'll just like shut down and then I'll just like, you know, want to feel sorry for myself. But trying to get out of that standpoint of like when you do feel self shame, you know, trying to nip it in the bud mm -hmm. to start and not letting it become a thing to where you're just wallowing in it. And yeah, yeah like right. you said, what was me? I've noticed that like when you get in that position, like the enemy just wants to, to get after you so hard. Like if he can get you to doubt your identity, like who you are in Christ, like what your gifts are, like what your talents are, like you will not be effective for the kingdom. You mm -hmm. will not be who you're called to be in Christ in any way, in, in your relationships, in your jobs, for your kids, for your wife. Like, so I think that is just such a, the battleground of your mind is so big in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a constant battle. Yeah. I think you should, you should feel it, but then you should move on. Right. You know, like yeah. you mess up and that's helped me a lot. Like, you know, I mess up or even if I was like, I say I'm going to do, do something and I don't, then I feel the <laughs> shame and this guilt about it. But it's like acknowledging that shame and guilt of like, okay, I messed up. Let me have this moment of like feeling guilty mm -hmm. and feeling bad about myself, but then taking that next step forward of like, okay, now I'm going to do better, right. you know? And I think through Christ, that's one of the things he gives us, the spirit gives us, is that ability to be renewed and just try again. Mm -hmm. Like that's totally. one of our kind of Christian superpowers is that we can, we are forgiven. We can just start over. Yeah. All right. We can move on. We can try to get two more questions real quick. Okay. Um, what qualities do you look for in a mentor position and resume or passion and purpose? Say it again. <laughs> Sound like a couple questions. Yeah, in one. I think there's a few in there. So if you're looking for if you if you're looking for a mentor and there's these qualities, would you rather have somebody who like it's position and resume or it's passion and purpose? How I looked at that is uh, like ha someone that's like someone that I want to be like when I'm in their season. Like they're clearly a lap ahead of me. Like for example, I'm mid twenties, just had a kid. Like I want to look at someone who's ten or fifteen years older that has a few kids that's you know been successful in the things that they've done. They serve their church well and their family. Like, where do I want to be in the next season of my life? Just find somebody that I feel like is doing that well. Because you, know, you, you can apply that to any season. Like, if you're in you're in high school, like, hey, maybe find somebody in college that can mentor you that's recently been through what you've been through and so on and so forth. You're not married, but you want to be. You're young. Like, find someone who's who's married, who mm -hmm. is doing what you want to do. Maybe 
I think your passion is aligning certainly helps because you can for sure. connect on that. But for me, it's just like yeah, well, I'd much rather talk to somebody who's been where I've been versus somebody that has like a PhD or like those graduated right. from like seminary, you right, know. Right. <clears throat> so yeah, just simply to answer the question, I think looking for somebody who's been where you've been, you know, whether it's struggled with, you know, things you've wrestled with in the past mm-hmm. or have multiple kids and they're, you know, two decades ahead of you and they've been through similar things and, 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 and transition. So at least for me, I, I would say, yeah, finding somebody who you can relate to on, you know, the simple things like family and marriage and those things, but also the deeper things of like, Hey, I used to really have this addiction. Can you speak into that? How'd you defeat that? And, you know, when you, when you felt it cre- creeping back in, how do you, you know, continue to put it to death and what are practical steps that you kind of put into place now? Um, et cetera. So I think, I think that's probably the best quality to look mm. for in a person. Yeah. For, from the nonprofit world, like I think about this a lot for board members. So I run a summer camp and it's run by a board. So there's, you know, six men and women who are kind of in charge of it. And so part of my job is finding these board members to, you know, join the board and who are really mentoring me and how I'm running camp. And, um, you know, I learned this in school. I I think about this a lot for board members, and I think it also applies for mentors, is there's three qualities that a board member or mentor should have, and that's wealth, wisdom, or uh, work. And to be on the board, they have to have two of those. So I think about that for mentorship of like, do they have wealth? Are they gonna like give money or resources to help camp succeed? In mentorship, it's like, okay, if this is for business or for, you know, or for spirituality, like, do they have um, resources that are going to, like, help me grow towards my goals? Mm -hmm. Second, wisdom. Um, Have they been through what I've been through? Do they have, you know, that knowledge that they can share to me that is not just that they've, you know, actually lived and experienced? And the third is work. Like, are they going to, like, put in the time and effort to walk through this with me or, you know, for in camp's case, like, are they going to come out and be a part of camp in the show? And they have to have two of those. So, you know, they maybe, they don't have wealth, but they're going to put the time in, they have wisdom, or maybe they, you know, don't have the time. You know, I've had mentors that have, they're like, yeah, I can meet 30 minutes a month, you know, but they have the wisdom and the wealth and the resources to like help. So those kind of three things is what I think about. That's good. It's really good. All right, last question really quick. We're running out of time. Um, <clears throat> when do you think you can be in a relationship if you struggle with porn or lust? Say when? Yes. Yeah, let's let's end on just a quick one. We can <laughs> <laughs> run through. <laughs> well, I, was just, I mean, at least for me, I just would say making the distinction between being addicted to pornography but, also, but like struggling with lust. Um, yeah, I would argue that they're two different things. Mm-hmm. Um, That's good. You know, I think... To some extent, you're always going to wrestle with lust, you know, but giving into and actively seeking out porn is a different thing to where, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of what we talked about, like either last podcast or a few podcasts ago, that's the difference between stumbling at something versus like, you know, sitting in it and like really, you know, struggling with it. It's like, if, if it's an everyday thing for you, then it's not really a struggle. It's kind of just, you know, kicking your butt. So I would say, I mean, I think you can, you know, I mean, I, I I don't think that you should pursue a a, a girl if you are addicted to pornography, because um, I think that you're gonna you know treat that relationship or look at her the same way that you would look at you know this thing that you're kind of feeding. So, but with lust, I mean, I think if it's something that you have accountability around you and it's something that you're actively trying to defeat, I think you can pursue a girl. And um, you know, I don't, I don't, I always maybe kind of weigh on the side of like. You know, don't go to relationship and be like, hey, I really have a lust problem. You know, I mean, obviously, I, I wouldn't confess that to a girl right when we meet. Um, but, I mean, I think if you're actively. It's at least a second date. Yeah, date. yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, I would, I would just, you know, have people around you that, yeah, that you can talk to those things with and, you know, confess them to and, and ask that, you know, God would help you in those areas. But, yeah, I think that if you're, you know, wrestling with, with, with lust, I think you can pursue a girl if you have people around you that. You know, and all, obviously that goes without saying, like, if it's truly an issue, then I think you would know whether or not to do that. But, you know, if you're addicted to pornography, then I just would say no, because you're actively 
living in that and you're typing something in and you're scrolling and you're clicking on a video that that entices you. So I would say that that's a that's a no. Yeah, I mean, would you want to be someone who was – would you want to date somebody who they were addicted to? Porn? No. You know? And it doesn't mm-hmm. stop when you have a girlfriend. Right, it doesn't just go like, away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I even in church, like I remember hearing this, like the sermon of like, you know, if you're like – if you're lustful or whatever, like you should get married because then you have like a wife. And I'm like, <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> like, yeah, no, because it it doesn't stop once you get married. Like you're yeah. whatever you're doing, not married, you're going to keep doing when you're married. Yep. Yeah. And so you've got and it's way easier to deal with that with yeah. yourself. Totally. Yeah. When you're before you're in married or even just in a relationship, because like, you know, having a a girlfriend uh, ha- takes a lot of time, you know, yeah. that you yeah. are spending doing that rather than working on yourself or, you know. Not only are you still going to struggle with it, but then you're going to put expectations on your wife yeah. Yeah, right. to meet this and then that's just going to be miserable for, yeah, every, for right. everybody. It's worth so. it to just take the time beforehand to yeah. solve the problem yep. Yep. rather than Absolutely. the marriage counseling it's going to take after. Yeah. I just I, I would say more so shy on the side of like John Luke was saying more so not getting into something knowing you're struggling either with lust or pornography because mm-hmm. if you don't have boundaries and a rooted uh, I don't want to say plan but foundation going into a relationship it's mm-hmm. going to be a train wreck even totally. because with lustful desires becomes physical actions that follow a thought right mm-hmm. and so with that that can invite an impure relationship and then with that there just offers opportunity for other things and so i think until you have a like allow the holy spirit to just overpower that desire and because i know just as us men how hard that is but because i think you can set yourself up for failure say man hey i i'm still struggling with this Mm -hmm. but like this is this girl like i want to get to know her man that if you're a college guy and you want to get to know a girl and you're struggling with lust or pornography, physically, that's going to amplify if you're totally. together. And then you know what happens when you start developing a actual intimate relationship mm-hmm. as far as like a not a physical connection, but just like, man, I like the personality mm-hmm. she has or he Marshall. has. Like, that leads right. to a physical connection that we oftentimes will slip up on. So I'd yeah. say guard your heart. Um, and Paul talks about that. Guard your heart. Uh, and think more of her heart than your own because if you do that then you'll protect hers over yours and then when yours is ready you'll be ready to go yeah that's good yeah yeah Yeah, i think it just goes down to like what what you define as struggling with lust right it's like if you have a thought but then you're like telling yourself nope and then you you move on that's different than like every attractive girl you walk past you're like whoa wow oh my gosh wow you know like that that's not you but then you're like but i'm not but you know but i'm not masturbating to pornography it's like well okay you know so i think it just goes down to what you define as struggling with lust right it's like if you're actively trying to defeat it like that that's different than like just you know thinking every attractive girl you see like you want to you know whatever so i think it just kind of just goes down to how you identify what struggling looks like I had a lot of questions that people asked about what is the format going to look like for next season. And um, dun, I'm, dun, dun. I'm, hoping, I'm hoping we do the same format next season. If you guys are all down for it. Down. Yeah. Go down the clown. Absolutely. Well, you heard it here first. Season six, we will be back. <laughs> <laughs> we will be back. And um, rumor has it that we are going to try to tackle the book of Romans. Um, in season six. So stay tuned for that. Um, I have no idea when that'll be out, but it'll be out uh, soon. We, uh, well, yeah, I'll keep you posted, but uh, thank you so much for um, just for the season. I hope that uh, the book of James was able to speak to you and that um, you're still even thinking about some of the things that maybe we talked about. And I hope these last three uh, episodes where we just answer questions from you guys was uh, impactful. Um, you know, please do not think that we are the, uh, best source of material for wisdom because we're not uh but also hope that um there's a relatability to things that we talk about that you feel like you can see yourself in so thank you so much for uh being with us this season and stay tuned for season six where we will go through the book of romans as a group and maybe jacob will join us who knows we'll see